Good evening. This is Creativity at Work, and I'm your host, Dave Tyson. This evening, we, our guest is Jean, Dr. Jean Maloff. Good evening, Jean. How do you do, Dave? Great to be on the show. Good to see you again. You have been an expert on cold fusion, and what we'd like to know is, what's going on with cold fusion these days? Well, there's a lot more going on than one hears in the press, that's for sure. Uh, you know, when the discovery was announced at the University of Utah in 1989, uh, for a while it had quite a bit of play in the media, and then it seemed to have disappeared uh, because, allegedly, uh, the famous laboratories of Caltech and MIT and the Harwell Laboratory in England had shown that there was nothing there, that this amazing claim of Pons and Fleischmann to have gotten much more heat out of their uh, cold fusion cell than uh, was going in. There's a little cold fusion cell in my book, Fire from Ice, tells the story of the, the thing. Uh, they said, we can't find it. Pons and Fleischmann are alive. They weren't killed by radiation from their experiment. Therefore, the whole thing is wrong. Well, it turns out, actually, Dave, that uh, the field is alive and well, particularly in Japan, where there is a national program to develop this source of energy. It has no known explanation, let, but it is a potent technological uh, let, development. Let, let me um, interrupt you for a minute. Sure. First, um, what is cold fusion? If I knew exactly how cold fusion works, or worked, or wor still works, okay? If I knew how, and I could write that up in a paper and have it accepted in a journal and have everyone agree that that is, the, well, that is what this explanation is for this excess heat, I'd win a Nobel Prize. There are, are dozens of researchers today, theorists, who are trying to explain this phenomenon. That the phenomenon exists is no longer in doubt. What it is remains to be, remains to be explained. I guess what I was looking for was a uh, explanation, an explanation that our viewers could understand ah. in terms of uh, generation of excess heat. Ah, okay. What it does for the world is revolutionize the world. It ends the fossil fuel age and so forth in the following way. There is something in water that we did not know about before. There is an energy source in water that is completely beyond our understanding at the moment. The conventional way of thinking about this, the cold fusion dogma, so to speak, today, is that there probably are some nuclear reactions occurring in these water-based systems in the cold fusion technology that allows spectacular heat to come out, much more than in any nuclear reaction so far known. You're saying that in terms of energy in, energy out relationships. Yes. That in, and let's use the word cold fusion just for. Mm -hmm. for an, it, it's a semantic term. Yeah. It, it is a placeholder. Yeah. It is a. Uh, um, that in the various cold fusion experiments, they have been able to uh, generate higher ratios of heat than in the so called hot fusion? Hot fusion has never generated a single watt of extra power. Their power is in the form of radiation, number one. Number two, they have never generated more power out than input. Whereas cold fusion on day one in the Pons Fleischmann cell was generating immediately, from the day it was announced, more power out than in. Now today, in Japan, there are some types of solid state cold fusion devices that produce 70,000 to 1 ratios. They're still in the experimental stage, but in these very hot chambers that they have, they can create enormous energy with minimal input. And at the same time, the reason this word fusion gets in there is that the, the materials that were started with is heavy hydrogen, typically, which is present in all water. You know, water's H2O. But in the case of heavy hydrogen, which is 1 7,000th of all hydrogen on Earth, this hydrogen form is the form that typically was used. Now they found in cold fusion experiments that have now been patented 
by Dr. James Patterson, okay, the first United States patent that was almost accidentally granted, okay, uh, for this process. There's a war against the, uh, the, the other 200 patents that have, patent applications that have been applied for. Um, they have a cell that reliably produces 5 to 1, 10 to 1 power ratios using ordinary water. They have little plastic beads coated with nickel and palladium. And it's a marvel. At the, at the um, Fifth International Conference on Cold Fusion in Monaco, uh, Monte Carlo, Monaco, what I just got back from in April, they had this there, working in public. Anyone who wanted to, skeptic or supporter of cold fusion, could, could check it out. And it checks out perfectly. It works every time. I, I've been busy recently watching court trials. Mm -hmm. And I now have become an expert in questioning experts. Yes. Um, what qualifies you to talk about cold fusion? All right. Well, I would say because I'm an engineer and because I'm also a journalist, I'm the editor of this magazine, Infinite Energy, and I've been pursuing cold fusion since it started. So I've investigated it. Now, the people who disparaged cold fusion, by contrast, they did the hit and run in the beginning, such as my former colleagues at MIT. They had $30 million a year for their laboratory in hot fusion, which was going to give us a power source in the year 2050. They did some experiments in 1989 to try to verify Pons and Fleischmann. As it turns out, they got some positive results, but they didn't like those positive results. They didn't want to show them in public. So they pushed it aside, changed the data a little bit so that no one would get too excited. They didn't really think they had found cold fusion, by the way, are you but they me, left. Are you telling me that respectable scientists fudge the data? Absolutely. Happens all the time. Even some correct uh, discoveries have had fudge data. But in this case, they got some excess heat. They didn't like it, and it was too embarrassing. And besides, their $200,000 a year salary, the director of the lab at MIT, his salary would have been gone if this was correct. Well, this is correct. And now we are not only on the verge, thank thankfully, of either eliminating the Department of Energy, more power to them, but certainly eliminating much of the hot fusion budget, which is $500 million a year. It's going to be cut back minimum 38%. Who's, uh, uh, who's uh, stimulating the cutback? Well, this would have happened anyway due, due, due to the budget cuts. No one is cutting hot fusion now because they believe in cold fusion. See, the source of the whole problem in this field is none other than the Department of Energy. They had a panel in 1989 of biased individuals. The record shows it. Basically, it was like having a panel of jurors who were prejudiced from day one. It can be proved that they were. And they were the ones who were given the responsibility to find out, is this amazing discovery in the United States correct or is it not correct? While the data was still hot, while people were still finding things, these guys were off writing a negative report. And then no matter what experiment came to pass afterwards, even experiments that gave them the data they were looking for in 1989, it didn't make any difference. It was like Galileo and the telescope all over again. You're just reading my mind. <laughs> well, but, you know, they, they wanted helium-4. They said, look, you think you're getting a nuclear reaction. Show us some helium-4. Well, here it is. This experiment on the cover of the first issue of the magazine that came out only a couple months ago shows over and over again we can get, or Roger Stringham, the inventor, can get helium-4 where no helium-4 existed. This is a transmutation of an element. This is a shocking thing, but it's there.